part of industrial America, fringing the lower shores of the greatest inland waterway system in the world, stand the arsenals of the steel makers, the giant furnaces of Chicago and Gary, of Detroit and Toledo, of Lorraine and Cleveland, of Buffalo, Youngstown and Pittsburgh. Here in these lusty brawling cities which have given America world supremacy in industrial production, we are making steel for victory. lakes, over 90,000 square miles of landlocked water, on which no ships of war have sailed for a hundred years. Today there is a battle on the Great Lakes, a battle for steel production involving the greatest fleet of lake carriers the world has ever known. These are the ships that carry iron ore from the great ranges in the north to the steel mills in the south. A chain of mammoth freighters moving ceaselessly, traveling in a continuous procession day and night, forming a gigantic water bridge a thousand miles long, a bridge of American ships over which three million tons of precious iron ore move at one time. At the head of the lakes, protected from storm by a natural barrier, lies the Duluth Superior Harbor, the world's largest ore loading port. In this deep water shelter, the Battle of the Great Lakes begins. It is a race against time, for in eight months of each year, we must freight enough ore to keep the steel mills working through the winter. These ships and the men who sail them are fighting and winning the battle of steel production for us. Ninety miles above Duluth, an army of Americans is working the great Misabi range, taking iron ore from the mines of Coleraine, Marble and Evelyn, Chisholm, Virginia and Hibbing. Here in the largest open pit iron mine in the world, Giants work 24 hours a day. Electric shovels weighing three quarters of a million pounds, moving through the ore deposit on their own tracks, scooping 16 tons of ore in each dipper, loading a 50-ton car in three scoops, 100,000 pounds of ore to each car. This is America at work in time of war. Here we have dug a man-made Grand Canyon, a mile wide, 400 feet deep, two and a half miles long, carrying in its vast maw over 70 miles of railroad track. Day and night, the trains move to and from the loading machines, then drive up the shallow grades to railroad yards on the surface, where the 85 car trains are assembled for the run down to the docks. Ninety miles down the range, the long trains roll. Roll down to the ore docks at the harbor, carrying eight and a half million pounds of iron ore in each load. And below the massive trestle works and ore bins lie the lake freighters, all hatches open, waiting for the big chutes to lower, waiting for ore to flood down in a mighty stream. Average loading time, 
14,000 tons in three hours. Record loading time, 13,000 tons in 16 minutes. Enough ore in a single cargo to build six destroyers. of Lake Superior, the carriers push their way, ranging down from the ports of Duluth and Superior, Ashland and Two Harbors, carrying iron ore from the mines of the Masabi and the Gojebic, the Marquette and the Vermilion. Fighting storm and sleet and heavy weather to keep the ore moving, working through the peril of fog and snow and ice, to win the Battle of the Great Lakes. A battle we must win first in order to win the battles of the Atlantic and the Pacific. Far into the winter and early in spring, Coast Guard cutters and car ferries smash through the ice to keep the shipping lanes open. 36 hours from Duluth, a day and a half's run from the loading ports, lies the St. Mary's River system connecting the waters of Superior with Lake Huron. Here, the great ships enter the Sault Ste. Marie locks, dropping down 22 feet to the level of the lower lake. More than 20,000 passages are recorded here every season. Both freighters carrying a tonnage four times that of the Panama Canal twice that of the Panama and Suez canals combined. From the spring thaw in April to the winter freeze in December, an endless chain of ships moves, pounding down the long reaches of Superior, driving down through Lake Huron and Michigan to the steel mills below, where we are forging the shield of a sure defense and a sword for victory. Today, our steel production is greater than that of all the Axis powers. By 1944, we will produce more steel than the rest of the world combined. The roar of the blast furnace is a song of steel and flame, a song that sings in the hearts of free men, a song of freedom. While we, the people of the free world, live, it will never die.